Greetings. In this video, I want to tell you about some work I've been doing on the formation and control of pores in hemifusion diaphragms. This is part of a quantitative synaptology project that I'm doing at the University of Göttingen. The function of neurons requires transporting neurotransmitter from a presynaptic neuron to the postsynaptic cleft. The neurotransmitter is held in vesicles that fuse with the membrane and eject the neurotransmitter. There's a variety of ways that this can happen. The main ones that I want to highlight are clathrin-mediated endocytosis, where the vesicle entirely merges with the cell membrane and must be later reformed, and the kiss-and-run mechanism, where the vesicle transiently fuses with the membrane in order to eject the neurotransmitter and it's then released. The other two mechanisms shown here are variations on this theme. Depending on the mechanism, the process of ejecting the neurotransmitter from the vesicle can take vastly different amounts of time. And it has been argued that clathrin-mediated endocytosis takes too long to be a viable primary mechanism, and doesn't account for the rates that signals are actually sent between neurons. I'll let people with more expertise in neurobiochemistry argue about that. I'm interested in the way that the membrane rearranges during the kiss-and-run mechanism. I'm taking a theoretical approach, and there's a variety of ways that one can simulate membranes at various levels of coarse graining. At one extreme, we have things like molecular dynamic simulations, the fundamental object in the simulation is the particles. Each particle has a force on it, dependent on all of the surrounding particles, and the systems evolve through time using Newton's equations. Whatever behavior you want to study emerges from the statistical properties of the particles, and should reflect real behavior as long as the force fields and the simulations are set up accurately. Unfortunately, many problems, such as membrane rearrangements, require large systems very large on MD scales anyway, and involve processes with significant free energy barriers that therefore take long amounts of time. This can make MD simulations prohibitively computationally expensive. At the other coarse graining extreme, we have Helfrich models. In this case, the membrane itself is the fundamental object being simulated, and it has no internal degrees of freedom. Rather, you write an effective Hamiltonian in terms of the behavior of the membrane and see what it does. This model includes things like bending energies, so parameters like bending modulus and saddle splay modulus. And if the membrane can stretch, it also includes things like a membrane tension. Maybe it contains pores and some line tensions. These models can be extremely effective at simulating different membrane behavior. But since they lack internal degrees of freedom, the behavior being studied does not emerge from the lipid behavior, but rather every interesting thing that the system can do has to be explicitly included in the model, making it a bit ad hoc. One also has to worry about the validity of the approximations. For example, this term is an expansion about small curvature, and if you want high curvature in your model, you need a more sophisticated description. These are, of course, the extremes on the scale of coarse graining, and there are many intermediates. The one that I want to focus on here is self-consistent field theory. Rather than focusing on the individual particles or the entire membrane, the molecules are coarse-grained and, in a sense, aggregated into one statistical entity. So rather than looking at individual molecules, the fundamental object of the simulation is the statistics of molecular species. This work combines different types of simulations and calculation techniques, making predictions using the phenomenological Helfrich type calculations and testing them against molecular simulations and self-consistent field theory. The most unfamiliar of these to the viewer is probably SCFT, so I'll briefly explain how that works. We start with some system configuration phi, which gives a set of local concentrations of each of the molecular species. From these, I can calculate a set of fields, W of R, which gives how much energy is associated with placing, say, lipid heads or tails or water at any given point in the simulation. From the potentials, I can calculate the statistics of lipids using standard polymer physics techniques, which preserve the connectivity of the chains. This in turn gives me probability distributions of monomer types and therefore concentrations. So starting from some configuration, I can calculate the configuration that the system wants to be in. If these are the same, the system's happy and is in a stable or metastable configuration. Otherwise, the difference gives me local exchange chemical potentials that drive the evolution of the system. Since membrane behavior is emergent from lipid statistics, the membranes can do whatever membranes naturally want to do, without any additional phenomenological parameters. But since I'm not tracking individual particles, the calculation can be much faster than MD. This technique also gives me direct access to free energies as well as free energy derivatives, so things like pressures and tensions. A more thorough description of SCFT is given in the other videos on this channel. When it comes to simulating the kiss and run mechanism, I want to focus on this critical step. After the vesicle is partially fused with the membrane and when it spits out the neurotransmitter, I'll save computational resources by only simulating the subset of the system of interest, the hemifusion diaphragm itself. In addition to self-consistent field theory, we also used coarse grain simulations with a Martini force field. This is a cross-section of the hemifusion diaphragm using these MD simulations. There are different ways that I can simulate the hemifusion diaphragm. For example, if I use the canonical ensemble or the NVT ensemble, 
This fixes the number of lipids, essentially fixing the membrane area. There's some compressibility, but it's basically fixed. Fixing the system dimensions fixes the diaphragm size. The system contains a certain amount of single membrane area inside the diaphragm and a certain amount of double membrane area. Changing the diaphragm size effectively converts between single and double layer regions, thus changing the total membrane area, which is not allowed if I fix the total membrane area. Now let's consider a hemifusion diaphragm that's in equilibrium. First consider that it's in chemical equilibrium. The chemical potential of the lipids is the same everywhere. If it wasn't, then the lipids would move. And the chemical potential sets the membrane tension. Thus, the membrane tension in each portion of the membrane has to be the same. I can write this as sigma HD equals sigma B. The system is also in mechanical equilibrium. At every point on the membrane, the forces have to balance. This includes at this threefold junction. We have a tension of two sigma pulling on the threefold junction, trying to make the HD bigger, and a tension of sigma pulling in the other direction, trying to make the HD smaller. There's also a force from the line tension of the threefold junction itself. To see how this acts, let's look at the free energy in terms of these parameters. Note that the way that I've written this assumes that the tension is constant, which is to say that we're controlling the chemical potential rather than the number of lipids. So this is more like a MuVT ensemble calculation than an NVT ensemble calculation. The second term gives the free energy associated with turning some double layer region into some single layer region, and the first term gives the free energy from the line tension lambda. This may look familiar to you if you're familiar with the physics of bubbles. The membrane tension looks like a pressure differential, pushing the bubble open, while the line tension looks like a surface tension. This type of behavior is quite general, and the result is known as a Laplace relation, with the pressure-like term being the Laplace pressure. We can differentiate this free energy to get the force on the threefold junction and set it to zero to see the force-free condition. This gives us a relationship between the membrane tension, line tension, and the radius of the hemifusion diaphragm. An important thing to note is that we can use the same logic on a pore in a single membrane. It has some line tension, pulling it closed, some membrane tension pulling it open, and effectively our free energy looks the same. It therefore follows the same Laplace pressure relation. So far I've been playing a bit fast and loose with the ensemble. On the previous slide I assumed that the tension was fixed rather than the number of lipids, and this gives rise to an unstable diaphragm or pore. If we consider a segment of the interface and calculate the force per unit length, the force due to the tension is constant, i.e. given by the membrane tension. And the force due to the line tension scales as 1 over r. So if a diaphragm or pore is slightly larger than the force-free size, the force causing it to grow will be larger, making it even larger. If it's slightly smaller, then it continues to shrink. Fixing the tension, the diaphragm or pore is thus unstable to fluctuations in size, and this optimal size corresponds to a maximum in the free energy. If we move to the NVT ensemble, then to a first approximation, fixing the lipid number fixes the membrane area. But to understand the behavior of the diaphragm, it's useful to use a slightly higher order approximation. I won't write it out explicitly, but you can think of it like this. If the area was fixed, it would be impossible for an HD or pore to change size, for reasons I explained on slide 7. In reality, there's some compressibility. Increasing the diaphragm size leads to less membrane area, so a smaller area per lipid and thus lower tension, thus smaller force trying to make the HD larger. And the opposite's true for making the HD smaller. The force-free HD is thus a free energy minimum, and it's stable, or metastable. One last thing that I want to mention is the case of a flat interface, where the radius of curvature is infinite. In this case, the interface just moves until the tension's zero. You can see this from the force-free condition itself, just plug in r equals infinity, or consider that changing the position of the interface doesn't change the line tension contribution to the free energy, and thus there's a net force of sigma on the interface. So as long as sigma is finite, it continues to move. Things get a bit more complicated when we want to study pores and hemifusion diaphragms. Not only do we have a complicated geometry, but we have three different types of interfaces rather than just one. An analytical treatment of pore stability becomes a lot more complicated, and it becomes very useful to use numerical models to compare with, such as SEFT and FD simulations. The MD simulations that I'll show in this talk are a coarse-grained MD conducted with a Martini force field, and were done by my colleagues Alareza and Yulia, who are co-authors on the paper. Let's start with a simple case of a pore next to a flat interface. As with a hemifusion diaphragm, there's a line tension around the pore trying to close it, and a membrane tension trying to keep it open. But as we saw, a flat interface will just adjust to make the membrane tension zero. So there's not actually a finite membrane tension pulling the pore open. The only force trying to change its size is the line tension that pulls it closed. This comes with a caveat. In order to move the interface, we need to be able to move lipids across the membrane. To make it simpler to explain, I've labeled one set with light blue heads and the other set with dark blue heads. If I fix the area of the light blue lipids, the area of the enclosed region is essentially fixed, but changing the size of the single layer region requires the enclosed region to change area. If we want to close the pore, we therefore need to move lipids from the enclosed region to the outer region in order to increase its area, and in doing so, we shrink the enclosed region. 
i.e. move the threefold junction such that the single layer region increases in area. If it helps, you can think of the region labeled dark blue as a pair of membrane leaflets, i.e. a membrane bilayer that just happens to have another membrane structure inside it, the light blue leaflet, inserted between those dark blue leaflets. If they can't exchange lipids, then the dark blue leaflets just behave like a membrane in the NVT ensemble, making the pore stable. If they can exchange lipids, then the inner structure, the light blue leaflet, acts like a lipid reservoir, making the dark blue leaflet behave like it's in the MUVT ensemble, i.e. fixed tension, where the pores are unstable. Moving lipids across a membrane is done by so-called flip-flops, which are catalyzed by fliplases or scramblase proteins, which can be turned on or off, for example, by calcium signaling. In our MD simulations, we enable flip-flops by inserting an auxiliary pore that allows lipids to move across the membrane. The free energy barrier to a flip-flop is large enough that we expect maybe one lipid to cross the membrane in the entire time of the simulation, so we need something to increase the rate. If we remove this auxiliary pore and do the simulations without flip-flops, the large pore that we inserted becomes stable, as predicted. We don't have that difficulty with self-consistent field theory. The way that lipid statistics are calculated and the way the system evolves makes lipid flip-flops instant in SCFT. SCFT calculations are also a lot faster and easier to change system parameters, so we can sweep through parameter space and see how the pore behaves for various lipid architectures and parameters. The important parameters in SCFT are Cayenne, the Flory Huggins parameter, which controls the strength of head tail repulsion, and F, which gives the fraction of the lipid that's composed of tails, i.e. F gives the lipid asymmetry. I've also overlaid the spontaneous monolayer curvature because it seems to align nicely with the results, though I'm not totally sure why. It also makes the plot look prettier. The more directly relevant parameters are the line tensions. I've not shown them here because it gets complicated, but see the paper for details. Anyway, we can start with a system like this, insert a rim pore, and see how it behaves. Consider a pore that looks like this. The appropriate line tensions are lambda p, lambda e, and lambda h. These give the free energy per unit length associated with forming whatever type of interface. The region with the pore thus has a free energy lambda p plus lambda e times its length, and the threefold junction has a free energy lambda h times its length. If lambda p plus lambda e is less than lambda h, then the system can lower its free energy by simply unzipping the single layer and double layer regions, i.e. growing the pore along the interface. If lambda p plus lambda e is smaller, then the system can lower its free energy by shrinking the pore away. I haven't directly shown the line tensions here, but the condition lambda p plus lambda e equals lambda h follows this diagonal nicely. But once again, there's something weird. Right at the diagonal, there's this region where pores get small but don't quite disappear. These are metastable prepores. They've been seen before in flat membranes, but they appear to be more stable in these rim pores. They occur because as the pore gets small enough, the lipid head groups pack against one another, and trying to shrink the pore further increases this repulsion. This effect is pretty subtle, and as you can see, it's only present when the tendency to grow versus the tendency to shrink are almost balanced. Now back to our regularly scheduled circular hemifusion diaphragms. If we want to understand rim pores in circular diaphragms, we need the model to take into account finite membrane tensions, as well as complicated geometries and multiple line tensions. I'll provide a brief overview here, but if you're interested, I invite you to see Appendix A of the paper for more details. We start by writing the free energy like this. The first term is the free energy of the rim of the hemifusion diaphragm, given by its length times the line tension, lambda h. The fourth term subtracts off the length of the HD rim that's deleted by inserting the pore. The second and third terms give the additional line tensions associated with the rim pore and edge type interfaces. The last term is the free energy associated with changing the membrane area when the pore is created. If we approximate the membrane as incompressible, we can say that this change in the area is zero, and use the membrane tension sigma as a Lagrange multiplier. The way that I calculated the lengths of the line tensions assumes that they have a particular type of geometry, not protruding or bulging outwards or inwards, i.e. assume that the angle between lambda p or lambda e and the horizontal measured on the right hand side, as shown in the diagram, is always less than 90 degrees. As shown in this diagram, however, they can bulge outwards, creating an extra length that's shown in this box. These capital lambda terms that I've added to the free energy account for this. If capital lambda is 1, then the respective interface is protruding outwards or inwards. When I calculate the area change, it looks like this. The first line is simply the area of the system with a bare hemifusion diaphragm, and the rest accounts for the pore. It turns out to be convenient to scale out a length and a line tension from the description. The tilde indicates such a scaling. I've chosen the radius of the unperturbed hemifusion diaphragm as the reference length, and lambda h as the reference line tension. To see why I can do this mathematically, well, look at the equations. But physically, picture a geometry shown in the diagram. Now imagine if it's scaled up or scaled down by some constant length scaling, or if the line tensions are all multiplied by some constant. If I scale the membrane tension appropriately, the scaling does nothing. The junction points where three interfaces meet remain force-free, 
or the net force is simply scaled by the line tension scaling. The tendency for an interface to move is given by the membrane tension, the line tension, and the radius of curvature. Scaling all of these together changes nothing. This is a pretty hand-wavy description, and if you're unconvinced, it may be useful to take a closer look at the scalings as described in Appendix A of the paper. Either way, after the scaling, I get this form for the free energy, which I solve subject to this constraint, i.e. delta F is always calculated subject to CA equals zero. If I want to find optimal, i.e. force-free geometries, this corresponds to solving this equation, again subject to CA equals zero. Without getting into details, I do this numerically and I'll show the results next. Here I've plotted the size of the force-free geometries in terms of lambda E and lambda P. The size is given as a fraction of the bare HD size, and this area ratio only goes up to 0.5. To understand why this is, consider that as the pore grows, I'm essentially moving membrane area from the region of the HD into the double layer region. If all of the single layer turns into double layer, I've increased the double layer region area, so the resulting fusion pore has to shrink. On the right hand side are some sample geometries. The one labeled SCFT is calculated for the line tension ratio for the SCFT parameters that I've used throughout most of this work, and DMPC and POPC are two lipids that we've simulated using the coarse-grained MD simulations. The others are just interesting examples to show what these optimal geometries look like at various points in this phase diagram. If a reservoir or effective reservoir is present, for example if flip-flops are allowed, these force-free pores are critical, i.e. they're unstable, and if they're a bit too big then they grow, if they're a bit too small then they shrink away. As critical pores, they're interesting biologically in terms of letting material pass, because for one thing, a force-free pore is the easiest to hold open, using whatever mechanism a cell might choose. For another thing, if a cell wants to open a pore and have it close again, the critical size controls how large it can be before wanting to close. This is assuming a reservoir. The cell has many options to prevent this, turning critical pores into stable pores. One way is to turn off flip aces and scramble aces, so lipids can't flip-flop, Another is by fixing the size of the HD rim. Fixing RH has the same effect because flip-flopping entails changing relative area of the single and double layer regions. In addition to the general behavior of the size, you may also notice regions where data is absent. This is where pores are never stable. You may also notice the outlined region. Outside of this region, pores protrude. Going region by region, at the bottom left, labeled A, if lambda E plus lambda P is less than lambda H, pores always grow as we saw earlier. In region B, where lambda P plus lambda H is less than lambda E, the free energy can be reduced by eliminating the edge tension by pinching off the pore, creating a fusion pore that's disconnected from the hemifusion diaphragm. Similarly, in region C, where lambda E plus lambda H is less than lambda P, the pore can lower its free energy by disconnecting, migrating into the hemifusion diaphragm rather than being a rim pore. Next, we can take a look at where the pores begin to protrude. To understand the condition for when the rim pore starts protruding, consider what happens at the point labeled 2. When the green curve meets the horizontal at 90 degrees, in order for the forces to balance at the junction, the horizontal components of lambda E and lambda H have to be the same. Their vertical components must also add to lambda P. Combining this with their respective Laplace conditions gives the condition that lambda E equals lambda H. Region E is a bit more complicated, but once again start by setting the blue curve to a semicircle, using the Laplace conditions for the representative interfaces, and breaking down the components to set the force at the junction points to zero. We find this relationship for region E. Now this might all seem quite academic. You're here listening to a theorist babble about how cool geometry is. But to a biophysicist interested in things like the kiss and run mechanism, this is cool because we essentially have two control knobs, lambda E and lambda P, and if the cell can change these line tensions, it can move around in this phase diagram. As it changes these two control knobs, it changes whether pores grow and shrink and what shape and size they want to be, i.e. the cell has knobs that it can turn to fine tune the size of pores and to manipulate their behavior, allowing it to spit out just as much neurotransmitter as it wants whenever it wants. But this is all based on a relatively crude geometric model. Our next step is to test it. We can test the predictions for critical pores by running SCFT and MD simulations starting from the appropriate areas and see if they grow or shrink. This is simpler with SCFT because the evolution is entirely deterministic, so it's easy to start from a pore that's only slightly too big or slightly too small in order to tightly bracket the critical size. It's also easier in SCFT to approximate the critical geometry. The difficulty setting up empty simulations make it more difficult to approximate the correct geometry, and random fluctuations make it a bit more challenging to bracket the critical size. The initial areas in the MD calculations that I've shown are actually the same and approximately equal to the critical size, and they may grow or shrink depending on these fluctuations. 
Note that the SDFD calculations with the shrinking pore converge on a pre-pore. The fluctuations in the MD simulations allow it to get over the small barrier and close this pre-pore. In the MD simulations, the pore may shrink down to a pre-pore, which it fluctuates around. The pre-pore can disappear, or random fluctuations can cause it to grow and become supercritical. Note that the MD simulations still require the auxiliary pore in order to allow flip-flops. In order to avoid flip-flops in SCFT, we need to actively prevent them by setting a repulsion between the head groups on the lipids in different regions. When we do this in SCFT, or we turn off the auxiliary pore in MD simulations, we can stabilize pores of various sizes. As we mentioned, this is one mechanism that cells may use to control pores, and adds another control knob to the cell's toolkit. Another control knob is the size of the hemifusion diaphragm. Here we insert a ring around the HD, which I can control to increase or decrease the HD area. If I increase the HD area, the system tries to prevent the total membrane area from changing by closing the pore. Closing the HD causes the opposite effect, opening the pore. Finally, I want to take a look at the process of forming and growing a pore. These calculations are done using the string method, which I haven't described in this video, but descriptions are available in other videos or the corresponding paper. The reaction coordinate alpha is an abstract quantity that essentially tells you how far the system has evolved. The free energy is given in terms of the membrane bending energy kappa, which is typically around 20 kT. So the barrier to forming a pore is on the order of 30 kT, which is pretty large but not insurmountable. The barrier to going backwards and getting rid of it is in the ones of kT. For small HDs, such as the one corresponding to the blue curve, once the pore is formed, the barrier to growing is pretty small. As the pore size increases, for example going to the red curve, the barrier increases quickly. Nucleation of a pore in a flat interface, shown in black, is not really applicable, so I've stopped it after the pre-pore is formed. I don't want to focus too much on this graph, so I'll just refer you to the paper, but I want to mention one thing that isn't in there. Notice how the curves for the pore formation have very sharp peaks for the round HDs, but are nicely rounded for the flat interface, and the free energy barrier gets larger, both to forming and getting rid of the pore as the HD size decreases. For anyone familiar with the method, the sharpness looks like a numerical artifact associated with not having enough points, but it's actually not. I repeated the calculation with more points to see if this was the case, still sharp, and I'm not sure why. The decrease in the free energy of the metastable pore is, I think, due to lambda p being less than lambda e, and the radius of curvature of the HD decreasing. As the radius of curvature of the HD decreases, the pore has more rim pore interface compared with the edge interface, so it gets happier. The kiss and run mechanism involves merging vesicles with cell membranes, forming a hemifusion diaphragm, opening a pore to the HD to exchange material, and then disconnecting the vesicle from the membrane. In this work, we combine self-consistent field theory, coarse-grained MD simulations, and a phenomenological model to investigate the stability and control of these rim pores in the HD. Metastable prepores form along the rim of the hemifusion diaphragm, and they collapse quite readily, but they can also grow into larger rim pores. These rim pores can either be stable or critical, depending on the presence of a lipid reservoir, and the cell has a variety of mechanisms to control the shape and size of these critical pores, and therefore to control whether these pores have a tendency to grow or shrink by controlling the line tensions. It can also control whether they're able to realize this tendency to grow or shrink by controlling flip-flops. This work has therefore outlined a number of control knobs that the synapse can use to control these pores, and therefore the release of neurotransmitter into the postsynaptic cleft. Thanks for listening. I've included a link to the paper in the description. Feel free to ask any questions or leave other comments in the comments section.